Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. Welcome to Leadership Voyage, the premier episode of the podcast dedicated to your pursuit of becoming a great leader. My name is Jason Wick, and I'm really happy to get this podcast off the ground here in January of 2022. In this very first episode, I'm really excited to have DJ Korchin. DJ has a unique background. Over the past 20 years, he has done many, many things. He's been a band director. He's been a playwright, a children's book author. I think you'll find the conversation really interesting. I had DJ on this podcast because I admire how gritty he is. And we took the time to dig into that in this half-hour conversation. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Season one, episode one of Leadership Voyage. DJ, it's great to talk to you, buddy. It's been a yeah. little bit. Thinking about some topics I wanted to discuss on this podcast, and one of them was grit. And when I think about people I've known, um, DJ Corchin is the guy who I think personifies grit the most, and I think we'll naturally get to that a little bit. Um, but as a weird exercise, I wrote down some of the roles I have seen <laughs> you in in the 20 plus years we've known each other. And here's what I've got, mostly professional, some personal, some kind of straddling the line. So we met in college. So I have student, student teacher, performer in a Tony award-winning production, sounds important, <laughs> a band director, a playwright, composer, retail worker, manager, author, husband, parent. Congratulations on a life well-lived. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's over. It's all downhill. I, I know. Yeah. When, when I <laughs> when I read that list of roles to you, I mean, what what comes to mind? What's your reaction hearing that that list? A couple of things come to mind. First thing that comes to mind is choice. I chose to be all those things. Every one of those things. I chose to get a job in a certain industry. I chose to be a band director. I chose to do these things, and I would love to go back and take a look at each one of those individual decisions and find out like, why did I make that particular choice in that moment? And I think it's a really good way to learn a lot about yourself. So I definitely, when I think about all those things, uh, you know, Steve Jobs says you can't connect um, the dots looking forward, only looking back. And like, I think that's really a fun way to kind of self-analyze is not just what you did, but why you did what you did when you did it. I also think that, about permission. So you just told me I was a playwright. You just told me I was, you know, an author and a musician. And it goes back to one of the things that I love to tell students when I talk to them, which is you don't need permission to be anything. If you want to be a writer, write. If you want to be a doctor, you know, go, go to school to be a doctor. If you want to be a dancer, be a dancer. Um, and you don't need permission and somebody to christen you like you are now an author. Like sometimes that's in the way of like a, um, a, a record deal to say now you're a professional musician or a publishing deal to say now you're now you're officially an author. I don't believe in that. Um, and there's industries that are starting to capitalize on that, such as like, so, well, self-publishing, which is there's really not a bad stigma to self-publishing anymore which there used to be when it first started, because all the people that were the ones doing the thou are now an author um, are kind of losing a little bit of that power. So I, I love that. But the other part about it is um, that you can choose to be more than one thing at a time, and you yeah. should be. So that's actually one of the books I'm, I'm, I'm working on right now. One of the children's books is about, um, you know, when we're asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? We're expected to um, answer, you know, the, the, the expectation is that you answer with one thing. And that one thing is usually like an occupation, right? Whether it's like, oh, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a, a chef, whatever you want to be. Um, so I challenge students to say, when you, um, when somebody asks you, what do you want to be? 
say three things and see what that reaction is and get into a conversation with them. I love it. Um, because if you, were to, if you were to ask any teacher right now who they are, right, they're not going to just say I'm a teacher or I hope they wouldn't. But, you know, if you were to say, well, what do you do outside of, you know, your job? They might say, I'm a painter. I like to go horseback riding or, you know, and, and those are things that are also them. So you're a teacher, you're, you know, a, a thespian, maybe you act on the weekends, you're a dancer, you do all those things, you know, uh, but you don't need permission to be all those things at once. And I think um, the one thing that we, we learn is how to answer that question differently when we're younger, or I'm sorry, when we're older than when we were younger, because we're ingrained to say, pick a path, and that's your only path, and that's where you're going to be. Yeah, I love that that idea of multiple uh, being multiple things. I think being told follow your dreams, maybe it was implied follow your dream. I think it's, right. a, it's kind of a yeah. single idea there. What I what I'm curious about going back a little bit to something you were talking about with permission. What's holding people back from giving themselves permission? Well, I think there's obstacles in place that are starting to break down. I think there there um, were institutions in this world that um, are uh, not adapting with um, the technology. So I think, I do think technology plays a role in being able to achieve some of the things you want to achieve, whether it's just being a dancer connoisseur by watching any type of dance on YouTube or um, learning to be a woodworker and, you know, just uh, on YouTube and, or, or I say YouTube, but any video channel or a podcast or whatever it is. Um, I got that, I learned that lesson, and I tell this story very often, um, uh, when I met John Hughes, um, who uh, it came into a store that I was working a retail job, and, you know, it, it was really slow, so he asked me, you know, we, he was very kind, and we spent about 30 minutes, and or maybe longer, I think, it all kind of went by very fast, but, you know, he asked me, he was, he was amazing, and he had, one of the things he asked me, he's like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to be a writer. And I said to him, uh, or, and then he asked me, he goes, well, have you written anything? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then you're a writer. He's like, and that's when, you know, it changed my life um, and really made me want to go after what I wanted to do, realizing that there was this fake institution in my head that, that I needed permission to go ahead, to, to go and do things. And so um, when we're ingrained that in order to do something, there's a, um, a specific structure you have to do, you have to go through that, and that's linear. And if you don't get past one of the first, you know, levels, you don't get to go to the second level. Mm. Um, and I think uh, we're all starting to look at uh, the world a lot due to technology, but some just cultural changes um, as nonlinear, um, as a, as a, as a multi, as, pardon the 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 uh, metaphor here, but like as a web. Um, where we can go around things different ways and it's not a straight shot, it's not a straight path and there's multiple options. John Hughes walks into a retail store and tells you three words and it changes your life. I love it, right? Um. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> amazing. I mean, he, he he dropped some other words and some other knowledge, but uh, uh, he was uh, he was a character, man. He he cursed a lot more than I thought he would, man. He was dropping the bombs left and right and it just made him so like, uh, relatable and uh, yeah. cool. Yeah. A little yeah. more real. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, talking about grit now. Okay. So there is an Angela Duckworth book we're both familiar with uh, about grit. She defines it in, in yeah. some ways. But um, as I said, when I think about people I've encountered, I think about you as a gritty person. And the reason I think about that is don't take it the wrong way. No matter how talented <laughs> you were at something, you know, whatever thing or things you were pursuing, you were scrap, you were scrapping, you were clawing, you were getting feedback, you were putting yourself uh, in front of other people to help make you better. You were essentially grinding it out, right? I mean, in sports, we talk about the um, the superstar who's been watched since they were 12 years old, and you know they're going to become a 500 million dollar player. And then we talk about grinders people who worked for everything that they got and they made it, you know, whatever that means again. Yeah. I'm just curious, you know, is there anything or things that you can point to in your nature, your upbringing, anything experiences that have helped to, to form your grittiness? 
Well, I think we all have our, our stories of resilience and, you know, being knocked down and how do you want to get up. And But I can point to one particular story that happened much later in life. You mentioned the, the Tony and Award winning show. <laughs> the, the thing you didn't mention was that uh, I my my job was um, to ride a unicycle and play the trombone, which uh, isn't like, you know, hey, I'm a seasoned thespian here, but... Um, one in a billion. Was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I actually, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly, but I had the opportunity to share this story with the person who it's about recently at a, at a reunion of that show, because I always told her I, I, I needed, like, or I always told myself I really wanted to tell her about this. Um, so I didn't miss a chance to tell her how much she impacted me. And it was this small moment. And I usually am impacted by really, really small moments that most people think are really passive. And, but I, I hang on to these moments, um, and use them as uh, as symbols of of um, where I want to get to. And uh, one of the, the best trumpet players in the nation, um, her name is uh, possibly in the world. Her name is Amy McCabe, and she uh, played in that show that I was in with. And she actually was just um, promoted to um, I think the first chair of the Marine Band, first time any um, female has been. Uh, has held that role and you know she's she's a great example of of grit and hard work um given the obstacles that are um that are more in front of her but um one of the things that we had was when i was it, it's actually it's funny it, it all ties into this we we're talking about the unicycle i didn't start that show riding a unicycle i got hired to play the euphonium and dance a little bit and um but i decided i really wanted to i wanted well at the time i wanted a paycheck bigger I wanted my, you know, more money. So I was like, oh, I'll ride a unicycle and play the trombone. So I I was really nice to the backstage guys and they put my, uh, they hit this unicycle uh, on a truck um, next to their Harleys that they would bring with them. And so, and every city I would practice and practice and practice. Eventually I got into the show. But a couple of months later, um, I remember we were, it was like a Thanksgiving, we were in Cincinnati and she, she put her hand on my shoulder as I was kind of sitting down. And for some reason, I don't know why she told me this, but she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm really proud of you because every time I've heard you say you were going to do something, you go out and do it. And um, at the time I was also saying I was going to get in shape and work out. And so I was like doing all these things. And, you know, in that moment I said, thank you. And, and I processed it. Um, but it became apparent that, you know, to her, I was, I was known for that. And I thought, like, wow, like, if you're going to be known for something, what a good thing to be known for. So I think that's where a lot of it came from, is that I liked being known for somebody that did what they said they were going to do. So that's where I got some of that resilience and perseverance um, that ultimately makes up grit and continued through. So if I would set a long-term goal, um, I would continue through it because I, I didn't want to not be the person that didn't, you know, said what they did. So. Um, that was just a small moment that I think really made a huge impact on the way I look at something. And if I say I'm going to do something to really come through, um, no matter how long it takes. And that's, you know, at the heart of the grid. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that that anecdote, DJ. I, mm -hmm. I, I hate to bring it down to earth, but, you know, it's the first time I think anyone has said they'd make more money playing trombone. So congratulations on that. Part. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. great. Uh, you did it. <laughs> um, no, that's a great that's a great story, and I think it's really interesting. When you were told that, sorry if you alluded to this in, in that in that explanation. When when Amy was talking to you and she was implying that you were known for this, doing what you know, doing what you say, essentially, um, were yeah. you were you aware of that, or that was a that was kind of an epiphany moment, or looking back, it was an epiphany moment, or how would you characterize it? Um, no, I was not aware of that. That was the first time I heard that. I've, I've since heard it from other people, which, which is a good sign, but that was, I was caught off guard, um, because I don't think I was known for that, but also I don't think I was doing it either. I think in that, you know, that was something that I was doing over the past like year or two with the show and there was like certain instances. And so, um, I don't know if I was always the person that was like, you know, would persevere through everything or would just give up or whatever. I don't know. But um, that was the first time it was kind of brought to my attention. And 
I really like that feeling. And I'm not ashamed to say that it was an external motivation that mm. helped me internalize that lesson. So now one of the one of the things that you have you have pursued is writing. You know, one of the things that you are is is a, a writer, an author. I don't know if you want to say children's book author or if that's too narrow, but for me, I have, I think, at least one or maybe two copies of all of your children's, most of your children's books here. Um, mm. You have a book called A Thousand No's, and I'd like you to tell a little bit about that book and a little bit about the message in that book, and feel free to, feel free to pitch it, I suppose, if you want as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So, like, um, so A Thousand No's, uh, was a book that was came together by a bunch of different lessons that I learned, including the one about John Hughes. But uh, it's a story about a little girl that has a great idea, and it's a giant metaphor. So there, the girl doesn't have a name, doesn't, you know. There's not um, a house or anything like that. It's, uh, but she had. It, it, it's with my favorite opening line I've ever written, which is she had a great idea, and um, and the next line is at least she thought she did, and that's when she got her first <laughs> no, and. Uh, <laughs> And it's about a story, uh, it's about a, this girl that um, is constantly like weighed down by all these no's and, but more importantly is that the no's were like forcing itself into her idea and changing it and twisting it to the point where she couldn't handle it anymore. And so she were to bring, or uh, she would bring other people in for help and then it became something different. And then at the end, it, you know, it's, it forms a giant yes, um, that with all the no's inside it. And I think um, when people, on the surface level, there's multiple layers in this lesson here, er, in this book, but when people look at the book and see the title and then read through it initially, I think on the surface, they think it's about dealing with rejection. And I don't really view it that way. I actually view it as opening yourself up to discovery. And so it's not necessarily, um, and because the book is linear, you can, you can you get that like, oh, at the end, there's this giant no. But really for me, it's about if you're open to all these no's, that yes may be discovered way earlier than a thousand. It's not necessarily going to be like go through your thousand no's and then you get your yes. It's more about if you're open to as many no's as possible, you're going to discover you know, your yes in there. And what that really looks like is that when you're getting feedback from somebody, um, listening to that feedback, uh, uh, and you don't have to agree with any of it or all of it or some of it, you can agree with as much as you want, but by opening yourself up to that feedback, you get that one little nugget that's going to make it that much better. And that's what makes it all worth it. And um, the, the book itself is actually pretty meta to the uh, how it um, actually works, with how it actually got produced, because I self-published it first, and it got picked up by a very large publisher. Um, and some of the discussions we had, they wanted to change it. And, uh, and, and the one I always tell is, like, they added color kind of trickling into it afterwards. And, and I was like, no, 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 this is a black and white book. This is the this is the best part about it. And so, like, they were, I was surrounded by a lot of professionals that knew what they were talking about. But here's me sticking my foot down and saying no, you know, digging my heels in and 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 not living my my book. And so, when I started to get rid of my expectations of what I think something should be, it gets in the way of me seeing what it could be. And my I wasn't able to see the vision that they were seeing because I was so broad. I was so dialed in on my expectations of what the book should be. Lo and behold, I'm glad I opened myself up and listened because the color part and the way it was like kind of trickled in at the end and kind of molded the yes um, is something that all the reviewers talked about. It's something that a lot of the readers talk about. Um, and it was something that I was adamantly against initially. And so uh, I, I, would, I always love to tell that story about how I actually lived the lesson of the book um, so that we can get rid of what, or at least put to the side our expectations so that we're open up to more discovery of different ideas. And at its heart, it's about inclusion. The more people you include in bringing ideas forward, um, the better your ideas get. Whether, even if it's just you brought in 300 people and one of those people made the difference um, in their feedback, you wouldn't have found that one person if you didn't bring in the 300. So it's all part of the process. So it's a long-winded way to say the book is about letting go of your expectations. <laughs> you also, in my opinion, are good at choosing when to not take feedback. In other words, you just said a minute ago, uh, open yourself up to as many people, as much feedback, include as many opinions as you can with the yeah. idea that maybe your vision 
isn't quite the ideal vision yet, right? It might morph. It should morph. Maybe yep. you might you might even be stating that it should morph. Yep. Part of being a leader is also knowing when it's time to move forward and and not. I won't say not listen, but I'm going to say it: not listen anymore and go on, right? So, what about yep. that process? You get some no's, but do you learn from every no? Do you do you use every no? I'm curious. How do you frame that? Uh, no, in fact, I reject most of them. And so, um, you know, when I write a book, I usually send it to. Uh, I call it the gauntlet. I put it through like um, you know five or six close people that most of them um, aren't afraid to challenge me, aren't afraid to tell me you know what they think and what they don't like, and some of them that are on complete different like walks of life, if you will. So like I tend to be on the liberal side of things. I might throw it to somebody that's you know a friend of mine that's super conservative or super religious or something like that to get their take on it. And there's been times when I didn't think of something that way because I wasn't even capable of thinking something that way. It was it just wasn't in my filter. But I also have to give myself permission to say like, well, this is also my creation. And so the bottom line in terms of leadership, I think is does it, it's not about that it's your idea. It's about the idea. And so as a leader, if the idea is ready to go and it's right, okay, then let's move forward because it's never going to be, you know, you could always make it better. And so at some point you have, is it good enough? And I think the same is true of the arts as well. The real win as a leader is, is this established as your culture way ahead of the discussion? So I call it a culture of positive brainstorming is that can somebody feel great about giving their idea to the group, it not being used or even just ripped apart and them still feel like they contributed. Like to me, that's the end goal of, of creating, um, you know, psychological safety within idea building is that everybody feels good about contributing to the nose, even when somebody goes, oh my God, that idea will never work, you know? Um, and because it's not about whose idea it is, if that's the case, then you don't have a, a good culture of brainstorming. It has to be about the idea of moving forward. And that has nothing to do with whether you're a leader, whether you're the expert, whether you know, it just, it, it doesn't. It's just, if it makes the idea better, then we move it forward. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, then we shouldn't. And so I think that's the, the culture you establish as the leader ahead of time. So that when you say it's time to go, everybody feels like they at least you know, contributed, even if none of their ideas were used. Great portrayal of the uh, positive brainstorming session and the safety. I suppose you're right, right? If someone is too afraid to be rejected or going to take it too personally when rejected, if you want to think about it as rejection in that context, then it is going to be a tough, yeah. a tough process, huh? Well, and that's where you have to, you know, when we talked about a thousand no's, that's where you're talking about instead of people viewing it as rejection, reviewing it as a way to discover. And that's, that's how people feel contrib like they need to, con how they felt like they contributed to it. One of my favorite leaders I ever worked for, she was stubborn beyond belief, super competitive. But the thing I loved about her, and I realized that I love this in a leader, is that you can change her mind. And so, but the stubbornness and the, and the filters that she had made it be like, if you are going to change her mind, you better bring your game. You better bring why. You better, mm. and it really forced you to think through whether or not this was worth it, whether it was a good argument, whether or not you had the right data, all these types of things. But you knew that you could change her mind if you presented the right information. And I just, I loved that about her because um, it really forced you to go back, get good feedback, have people poke holes in it before she did, and then bring your argument. Let's change topics for a second, um, get back to, or get to one last thing that we kind of touched on earlier. You were talking about yeah. uh, students. You know, you said when you work with yeah. students and you were talking about the con uh, the discussion around giving yourself permission and, and things like this, I think, at the time. What traits do you, do you admire the most in a, in a good student? You know, when we talk about being a good student, I think we often conflate that with being a good person. And those aren't necessarily the same thing, because generally when we say a good student, we want to say it's a person that learns the lessons well, right? Um, but a lot of times it's conflated with, oh, that person has humility, that person has um, compassion or is friendly, and you know that's a good student. And I, I guess I'm not one to say 
whether that's right or wrong, I think those are conducive to learning for sure. Um, but the thing I love to see in, in a student is their ability to celebrate others. I think that's something that I, I, I want to see in my own children so that when somebody is does something well or have something good happen to them, that they feel confident and secure enough in their own self that they can give them whole self to celebrating that person versus thinking about themselves and, you know, whether or not they can, they can do it or if they can, you know, or if they've done that too. And just taking those, you know, the I, me words out of it when they're, when they're having that discussion with somebody, I think the ability to celebrate somebody else um, is something that is a great determination, determining factor as to how successful they might be, no matter what they're going to do. Is a good leader a good student? I I would hope. I would think that a good leader is somebody that is always a student and never in like, now I'm in leader mode and now I'm in student mode. I think they're in some ways, leader and student are, are synonyms. I think there's a little bit to think about there. A lot of the times we think about someone at the helm of something and uh, uh, for the rest of us, we think, oh, they must, must uh, have figured it all out. But what I think I recall reading about Warren Buffett at one point was he spends almost his entire day reading, which which mm. is very interesting, right? Yeah. You know, you're always yeah. learning. You're refining your decision making. I wish I could do that and make billions every hour. <laughs> <laughs> Just by reading. <laughs> uh, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting because you can think about leadership, and there's two ways to motivate people well I, i'm sure there's more but if i were to break it down into two groups there's holding somebody accountable or inspiring someone to and i think they can both have the same results um but one is definitely more long term and more impactful around that um and i would rather be a leader that inspires somebody to whether that's me getting out of their way because i'm they're the experts and i'm doing that and you know, leadership in a team setting, in a group setting, when you're talking about, I'm the leader of this group, I don't see that as a um, just necessarily the most expert person in the role, because that's not how good teams are made. They're good, you know, they're good teams because you hire people that are good at what they do and, 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 and have belief in what they do for their particular roles. But leader in that sense is, a, is, is just a role. It's a role to play. It's not a you're not a parent, you know, you're not, uh, in, in some ways I would say you're, you're, you're even not supposed to be in charge, right? I think there's a, there's a hierarchy for a reason. Most of it has to do with deadlines and times and all that to your point. Like sometimes you just got to go and make a decision. You need that hierarchy, but a good leader knows what their role is and what their role isn't. Um, and I think that's a really positive trend that we're seeing in leaders nowadays where it's like, you know, a lot of leaders like to get out of the way. Because they realize that um, their job isn't to do other people's jobs. It's to inspire them to do their jobs the best they can and do the best work they can. Yeah, thanks. Great answer. I love that. We're just about at the end of our time, DJ. Um, and this, of course, is the very <laughs> first podcast I've ever done in my entire life. So, But what I will plan to do is uh, ask everyone this same question at the end. Because yeah. I'm curious about the, uh, curious about the answers. What's something you've learned recently? <laughs> well, I'm. Thank you for having me on. I'm honored to be the first. Um, I, 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 I'm expecting a trophy and a plaque, um, and I'll put it up behind me. Absolutely, and, and display it. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that people have I, I've been randomly posting on social media lately has been like me woodworking. So, um, and I've been really into woodworking and it's just another creative outlet and, uh, it's a physical outlet too. So I like, I get tired lifting stuff and, you know, you have to kind of be on a little bit as well because, uh, you know, you don't want to hurt yourself by not paying attention, but it's been really, really fun. And the one thing that I've learned about woodworking is that you can't sit there and say, I want to make this, I I'm going to make this amazing piece of furniture and it just happened because there's so many tools involved in making a piece of furniture 
you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to take woodworking classes and, or I'm sorry, you can't say, I'm just going to be a, a woodworker and then make furniture. You have to learn the individual tools. So you have to, you know, learn how to use a table saw. You have to learn how to use uh, clamps and, and, and jigsaws and all these other fun tools. And each one of them, especially like routers, I've been really into routers lately, but each one of them has their own little nuances and their own little mastery of it. And without learning those tools, you can't really put together the big, you know, result or the goal at the end, the big furniture. And so I think it's very true of uh, artists as well, you know, whether it's musicians learning different tools of making music and putting sound into silence, um, whether it's artists, you know, different paint brushes and different um, inks and paints and, you know, or being an author, different different bindings and um, inks and paper and all the distribution, all these, these are all tools that are used to make something successful and have a bigger vision of what you want to be and what you want to do. But we don't deliver, you know, we talk a lot about that, that big vision, but we don't talk a lot about the tools that we need to get there, whether it's collaboration or good brainstorming, technical skills, feedback, those types of things. And so do we practice in our teams, um, getting better at those tools. And so do we practice as a team or do we practice as individuals? Because if you're trying to make something as a team, you should practice as a team as well as your own personal um, development there. And I think, yeah. it's, I think woodworking is a good metaphor for that. And, you know, I can't make an amazing piece of furniture if I don't know what a pocket hole jig is. I just can't do it. That's one of the things that I've learned recently that I'm applying to all of my professional and even personal career from woodworking is to really focus on diving into some of those tools so that I can actually be an expert in something and, and come from a, 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 a place of knowing what I'm talking about in certain things. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. I will add another another uh, noun to the list of roles, woodworker. That's a wonderful woodworker. thing. And, <laughs> and I have seen some of your uh, some of your productions, so outstanding. Thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I haven't fallen off the walls yet, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and there shouldn't be earthquakes in Illinois anytime soon, I hope. Well, but, uh, yeah. There shouldn't be, but nowadays you never, you just never, <laughs> you know. never know. I know. Good point. Yeah. For those who really uh, got a lot of interest out of this discussion, DJ, where would you like them to go to, uh, to learn a little bit more about you or what you're doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I'm in all the, the, the places and in, 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 on the web. I mean, not the deep dark corners. That's kind of creepy, but you know, just you go, you go to uh, my website, it's DJ You can, uh, I'll, you can find my, my children's books. Um, any, really any place you get your books if um but i do ask that you support bookstores um especially your local bookstores first before you go um on uh, some of those websites and, and and purchase it there support your communities um if they don't have them they can easily order them um or you can find me on instagram and facebook and twitter and all that fun stuff well thanks for coming on today dj it's really been a pleasure i know i've learned a lot from some of your answers and thanks for taking the time and uh, we'll talk to you soon oh my pleasure thanks jason Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. 